you're being asked to go on leaps and bounds in something where you haven't gone on any leaps ever. That's Jim Strang, chairman of HG Capital Trust. Today on Dry Powder, I'll ask Jim what it takes to be at the forefront of tokenization. We'll consider whether the launch of a few tokenized funds amounts to an interesting experiment with blockchain technology or the beginning of a trend you can't ignore. I would definitely be thinking through what's our version going to be, how much time, energy and resources and what gateposts do we look for along the road that says, OK, time to lean harder, time to push harder because things have evolved a bit quicker and they probably evolve quicker than we think. I'm Hugh MacArthur, Chairman of Bain's Global Private Equity Practice, and this is Dry Powder. So, Jim, do you remember when you first heard the word tokenization and what kind of opportunities sprung to mind? Absolutely, Hugh. So I first heard it from my brother-in-law. My brother-in-law is a computer scientist who lives in Canada, and he was the first one that brought this up, and I had absolutely no idea what he was talking about. Over the course of a hockey game, he did explain it in reasonable detail as to how it works. And then I understood about 10% of it, but it was better than nothing. So during the hockey game, your computer scientist brother-in-law brings up this notion of tokenization. When did you relate that to private equity and see some sort of connection or opportunity? Right. Yeah. So I think when these semi-liquid structures started to get going, if you look at how they operate and the monthly liquidity pattern and the way the vehicles work to you know, valuations every month. And then you're trying to slice up a fund, if you like, into much smaller constituent parts, which is what the individual customers are buying and selling. And then all of a sudden it's like, well, hang on a minute. Now that's beginning to rhyme with what this technology might be able to act as an enabler of. It might just let you go faster, potentially deeper, particularly as you try and drive down the lot sizes. And then obviously you'd go and explore that a bit further and you can actually figure out a way to do it. It's a really interesting rhyme because the initial application, I would imagine, would be an unlock and real transformation of the secondary markets because that type of liquidity for institutions would be incredibly valuable. But now we've moved on past the secondary markets to think about, well, this opens up an opportunity for a whole new stream of investors, individual investors, and what we've been calling the democratization of private equity, as well as providing a lot of liquidity for any investor, whether it's an institution or an individual. And for a lot of our audience, they're very deep into what tokenization is all about and what it can bring to private investing. But for a lot of other folks, they might be asking, what is tokenization? So I think the way I would describe it, it's a technology where you can create a finite digital asset embedded in the general dynamics of blockchain. And that allows you to effectively participate as the owner of that piece of digital asset in a broader investment structure. So I suppose that's the easiest way of describing it. It's like a piece of digital identity that you can use to tag an investment, which you can then own in your own right. Okay, so we're in the blockchain and we can do all of these decentralized transactions that allow us to kind of slice and dice in a digital way, pieces of portfolios and move them around in ways that we otherwise couldn't in, in the past, which is kind of an exciting development. And I know from just looking at the media and talking to some of our clients that we've seen a few private equity firms launch tokenized funds in the past year or so. Is this a trend? Is this real? Oh, yeah, for sure. It's real. I mean, the beginnings of it all are all around democratization. So there's this quest for smaller and smaller bite sizes. The bite size in an LP fund is millions of dollars, which obviously eliminates nearly all the customers, the individual customers. But if you can get that ticket bite size down far enough, then you just explode out a pyramid of potential customers. And the industry is trying really hard to figure out ways to do that. Right. So there's a lot of ways to do this. And as you say, democratization is another way of saying lower ticket size so individuals can participate more in private asset classes. And we see a lot of folks experimenting with how to do this. There's Moonfair and Opto Invest and the Titan Bays of the world. There are traditional asset managers like Fidelity and BlackRock and other folks that kind of, they're all kind of doing their flavor of it. Tokenization is a technological enabler as a way for alternative asset providers to actually do this. It sounds kind of easy, but if it was easy, everybody would already be doing it. So what are some of the biggest obstacles to actually launching a tokenized fund? Well, I think actually, if you sort of take a page back, I mean, one challenge is that if you think about the architecture of firms more broadly, they've all been built around the notion of the limited partnership, which is the access mechanism that we've had basically since the beginning of the industry. So all the infrastructure, which the firms have 
established and built up has been to solve for that kind of a solution. And once you start to head down the route of more of a wealth-based customer, goodness me, things start to change pretty quickly. So there's a journey and you set sail from the port of limited partnership and you head off in the direction of democratization. And there's quite a few things you have to cover along the way. And therefore, I think this is a challenge that the firms go through is, okay, well, if we're going to offer these products, which have got liquidity solutions that are embedded within them, then that means we've got to be able to solve for that. It also means we're going to have to up the cadence on the valuation points from four times a year to 12 times a year, which is a big ask. And then you have this world of, of the blockchain, which is quite a leap again. So you know, you're being asked to go on leaps and bounds in something where you haven't gone on any leaps ever. And therefore, you know, everyone's going to do it all at once. It's an interesting narrative arc, Jim, talking about the LP journey. And as you say, setting sail toward the individual. And you mentioned technological issues, valuation issues, liquidity issues. I imagine there are also regulatory and compliance issues. It's a messy process, isn't it? If you look at the typical LPGP relationship and what that entails, I mean, the investment process itself is quite analog and quite intimidating because it's bespoke. I'm filling out as an LP, as an institution, hundreds of pages of documents with lots of this and that and proof of whatever. That seems overwhelming to an individual. Can you talk a little bit about what you're seeing in terms of what private equity firms do to try and streamline this investment process in the whole efforts toward democratization. Yeah, I know for sure. If you've ever had to fill in a set of LP documents, I mean, it is like filling in a telephone directory. So you're trepidatiously hovering the pen over a box that you're going to tick and you don't know whether it's going to create an enormous tax problem for you down the line if you don't really know what you're doing. So I think what the GPs have done is try and strip out just as much of that as possible. And at one level, there's what the regulatory framework will allow you to do in the market that you're operating. So what form of investor are you treated as? Is it accredited? Is it qualified? There's a whole bunch of different rules and regs. So step zero is what will the regulatory framework let us do? And then within it, how do you eliminate as much as possible around the onboarding, literally going through the process of ticking the relevant boxes that you need to tick to become an investor. And then the other piece of it is obviously all about you. So the AML, KYC checks that have to take place against the individual, because at the moment, the regulatory burden is definitely that the individual has to prove that they are a suitable person in every sense of the word to be able to make these investments. The distinction I would make is as the chairman of a public private equity firm, in our firm, that doesn't exist because it's on a public stock market. So anybody that is willing to buy shares in the public stock market can participate in the investments that we make. So when you think about the ways that you can access this democratized version of private equity, there's a whole spectrum of them. And if you like, there's a piece of it which actually solves all these KYC ML problems because the vehicles are on a public exchange and they're regulated in that way. Where a lot of the action is at the moment are in structures where you still have to pass the KYC AML. And that's something that there's a continual push to try and simplify. And I mean, there are businesses out there like the ID register, which is one that I came across, which are trying to solve that exact problem, which is to strip away as much of this complexity as possible just to make it easier so that customers will not be terrified by the process. I think it's interesting where you started and where you finished that discussion, Jim. You started with the notion of the LP and the GP agreement being like filling out a phone book. I'm wondering how many of our listeners even know what a phone book is anymore uh, because it's so archaic, they don't exist. And for those that don't, a six inch thick book used to be dropped at your house every six months. And that's how you looked up phone numbers. We don't have that anymore. LPs still have to do that for GPs, which sounds very 20th century. But if we're going to go 21st century, we can't have the phone book anymore. We have to have something different. And where you ended was, by the way, if you publicly access these private asset classes by going through a public vehicle, that can obviate the need for filling out a lot of that phone book, improving this, improving that, because you're already going into a public vehicle as a way to access private vehicles, which is kind of an ironic twist. So there are different mechanisms that are being developed to make this simpler for us as individuals that I think will be fascinating because it really does determine how fast the take up is on the part of the individual and how far the interest really goes. And given that as a background, Jim, now, what investors are you seeing that are really seizing this opportunity now and which investors are kind of not really considering it, don't think it's relevant, may seem too hard? How do you, Can you sort of slice and dice the universe a little bit for us that way? Yeah, so maybe back sources and uses. So in, in terms of sources or, or firms that are going down this route, there's obviously several, notably Amsterdam Partners Group, KKR, where they are creating tokenized structures, either 
sub funds within structures that allow the sort of premise of tokenization, which is to bring the access point down to ten thousand dollars or twenty thousand dollars, the sleeve of an existing vehicle. So people are doing that, and actually with Hamilton Lane, you know, they tokenized one of their direct equity funds, but they tokenized their semi-liquid vehicle as well. So they've actually done two different versions of it, which I think is quite interesting to try and to broaden the potential customer base that they can appeal to. And you see others going in this direction, or at least looking at this, what's the right place to start from a product perspective. And then when it actually comes to the distribution of it, I mean, I think that even at a $10,000 ticket, it's more set up to be a channel-based distribution. So you're just going to have a channel partner who are, who are going to be able to use this product as part of their solution toolkit for their customers to actually be able to make these investments. I, I don't think it's actually direct to consumer yet, but it may come over time subject to the regulatory ability to do it because clearly one of the challenges of this democratization route is the providers of the solution are trying to get to the customers as quickly as possible without the channel in the middle because the friction costs are pretty high so actually if eventually this technology allows much more of a direct to consumer engagement then that's very profitable for the providers of the solution to try and acquire the customers directly and that's definitely going to be something that's attractive i think over time to try and go that way it's a good point, Jim. The efficiency of the technology really will allow it to get to the individual faster at a much more attractive cost point for the provider. And in thinking about this, you know, when I think about the minimums that that institutions uh, pay to get into a lot of these private equity opportunities, we see, you know, one, five, ten, twenty five million dollars is not typically being the minimum. And so how do you determine what the minimum could be in this democratization for an investor? And where, where is that? Yeah, well, I mean, it's a super good point. So if you come at it bottom up, if you think about the listed structures, I mean, the case of the one that I chair is $4 or £4. £4 gets you a share and the share is a piece of everything. So at one level is £4. But when you get to the semi-liquid structures, it's tens of thousands still. So if you like, we're not quite meeting the ends of the spectrum, we're not quite near. And the question is what happens in the middle? How far down the way could they go? You know, does it get to one? And if it does get to one, the level of flow is going to be significantly higher. So there's going to be complexity to that. You don't want to break this as you build it. Right. And so it's one of the things you're really honing in on that I'm interested in is the technology issue here. What kind of trading volumes or what kind of pricing could we be talking about? Well, think about in secondary PE, the traded flow is 1% or 2% of the size of the market. It's incredibly low. That could be 10 times bigger quite easily. The one thing I would say, though, is that one of the beauties of private equity is that actually the investors can't make bad liquidity decisions because they're not able to. We're about to create a whole bunch of liquidity, which might actually take away from the premise to some extent, because we're going to let the customers make the choices rather than the insiders. So your liquidity is a good thing, but be careful because it could also bite you. Um, but I mean, in terms of your question, how far can it go? It, it could be very much different to what it is today. If you think the speed that technology is evolving at and the ability to cut into smaller and smaller slices and to expand the amount of volume of traded flow, I mean, it's got a long way to go and it probably gets there quite fast. Assuming nothing breaks and assuming that it can navigate around the, whatever the regulatory frameworks are going to require it to navigate around. Okay, so you start with the proposition that we've got about 50% of the world's wealth in the hands of individuals. Those individuals have very low exposure to private equity and private markets. So the opportunity is huge. The mechanisms seem to be in existence to actually provide the access that we're talking about. How close is that future, that transformative future where we're buying and trading these things as individuals on a daily, weekly, monthly basis, in your view? Are we is that sort of Star Wars kind of technology, if I can use something that's a 40-plus-year-old analog, or is that something that's actually much nearer in? Uh, I think it, it's probably sooner than Star Wars. Um, no light years involved. I mean, I think it's probably five years, maybe. It's so embryonic that you need to sort of prove the ability to trade and the speed you can trade at, the velocity you can trade at, and the systems that sit below and their ability to cope with it all. But um, my sense is that you know it probably evolves quite quickly because it's almost the selfish gene, which is there's such an opportunity for the private markets to go down this channel that there's a massive amount of effort. I mean, the amount of time and effort that the big funds are spending trying to figure out how we do this because it's just such an obvious significant opportunity. It's the, it's the most significant opportunity that they will figure it out because they always do. And then it's just, you know, how long does it does it take to actually become mainstream? But yeah, I would have thought five years is my, my best guess. 
you know, Jim, as I'm sitting here and I'm processing our conversation, one thing that struck me is that if we roll the clock forward to five years or whenever it is, and we're all trading these private assets from our desks and our homes or our offices or wherever that happens to be, what is the nature of an alternative asset class in five years if we're all trading the same way that we trade public stocks? Is there such a thing as alternative asset classes in five to 10 years, or is that simply going to go away and be another thing that we trade? Yeah, we'll be trading whiskey. <laughs> That'll be the new alternative. I'm going to be first. Spoken like a true Scot. <laughs> yeah, there'll always be something new, right? But I think, it, it, and this is, goes back to my comment about some of the topics that Partners Group are talking about in some of their announcements, that you know the, the old definition of alternative is a bit like in the public markets, the definition of emerging markets is... You know, when Jim O'Neill coined the phrase 20 odd years ago, I mean, you know, they're not really emerging markets anymore, but the world moves on. And therefore, the new emerging markets are, are a different set to what were the emerging markets of 20 years ago. And I think we're in the same boat that you know, th this is going to become more mainstream and there will always be alternatives, but the alternatives will just be different alternatives. And, and maybe I'm right in it's whiskey. It's a good point. Markets evolve. We call them different things. The, the words change over time, but it's really about it's really about trading. It's about buying and selling. It's about having the opportunity to invest uh, in something you believe in, whether it's whiskey, arts, private equity, uh, or or common stocks. And uh, and so the verbiage needs to catch up with uh, with where the world is going. But it really is about innovation and ideas, and always has been. And that's not a faucet that we're actually going to to turn off anytime soon. And and given that it is the most significant opportunity for these large alternative asset providers, Jim. Is there anything that regulators can do to actually pull that future forward? Is there any way to make it happen faster than five years? I think they'll be going the other way. I think they'll be trying to make it happen slower. I think j just because it's not something that I think the regulators are hugely comfortable with. And, you know, there's press at, at the moment around some of the challenges of these structures. The industry needs to get ahead of that regulatory curve and really take them on a journey. And I don't know if anybody's really done that. If anyone's really sat down with the powers that be and said, look, this is what it is. This is how it works. This is why it's a good idea. And we're sort of 200% on top of this rather than, and also even from a regulatory perspective, there's a lot of regulators and and they actually operate independently. You know, the, the US regulator and the EMEA regulators in EMEA and different countries in Europe and the Far East, they're all slightly different in their way of thinking. So if you want to go faster on this, I think there's going to have to be some kind of agreed effort, combined effort to try and make it very comfortable for the regulatory bodies around the world to understand why you know, there's not going to be a horrible car crash here and, and then everyone's going to look not so clever. So there could be a grinding of the gears until we get to true tokenization. There are lots of ways, I think, that we've talked about to get, and we've talked about it in prior episodes of the show with other folks, to get the opportunity into retail investors' hands to invest in private assets, but really to do that at scale and to really have more frictionless transactions the way that you're describing, that's something that could actually take a lot longer because of the complexity of the regulatory issues in different countries. And the fact that you well point out is that there is no centralized body that's actually talking to all of these regulators about here's how it's going to work. And it, obviously, it's got to be a massive system with lots of participants in it. So it's going to take a while is what I'm hearing to organize that. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I agree. So given that, Jim, how should private equity firms really be thinking about the timing of any type of tokenization or blockchain strategy? Is there any note of advice that you would give to private equity houses that would rather just take a wait and see approach and say, well, if it's five years out in five years, call me and I'll tell you what I want to do? My sense would be it's just too important to ignore. But what your version of it is and what pace you go at and how you choose to implement the technology that comes alongside it very much an individual choice, but you should know what your choice is. So we know we're going to run this hard and this fast. These are the things that we're going to want to see and just get aligned around what that's going to be to avoid any sort of internal mismatches and conflict. Right. There are a lot of ways to play the game. The game is complex. And so thinking earlier about what your way is to play it and what you might do when the right time comes is going to put you in good stead. Because as you pointed out, it is a big opportunity, but it is a little bit of a first mover advantage opportunity as well. Those that get in there first and take up certain spaces, those spaces tend to be sticky and it's going to be difficult if you're very late to the party in order to jump in and actually get, quote unquote, your share of that. Oh, I think that's exactly right. And, and you already see some of the evidence of that around the way the customers are buying these products. I mean, it's 
it's there's not going to be limitless room of the party and it's going to be a, a case of getting in because the other the other thing with the private market um premise is the performance of funds is a bit more persistent than public so so actually for, for me what that means is switching costs are our propensity to switch is lower which means if, if there's less switching then the only way you can really capture the customer is you either get them at the beginning or something really goes wrong and that doesn't happen that often so if you want to capture customers, you kind of have to be at the beginning of the queue because once they've acquired their partnerships, they're going to be much, much less likely than it would happen in the public markets to switch them because the performance dynamic being what it is and actually the switching costs aren't zero, it's going to be harder to drive that decision. So again, that's another factor that just has to be borne in mind as you try and take advantage of this opportunity. Jim, this has been a fascinating conversation. I want to thank you again for coming by the show today. I'm sure our listeners will have benefited from it as much as I did and really learned a tremendous amount. So thanks again. Absolute pleasure as ever. Thank you. I'm Hugh MacArthur. Thank you for listening.